this ladies and gentlemen we are live this is the first time I've done a live stream for a long time on Twitch but uh, the reason I've been doing a, a live show on Twitch is because my VPN recently stopped working and I won't go live until I'm fully protected online but now that's working let's do this welcome to Satoshi's take on the court case the trial of the century let's get into it Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another installment of the CoinGeek special coverage of the Kleiman v. Wright case, hosted by yours truly, Kurt Wooker Jr. of CoinGeek.com. I am very happy and excited to be with you fine people for another day of madness. You think you're excited, Kurt? You should, uh, you should uh, taste the uh, taste. What? The excitement is palpable every time you come on. Um. And it was a day of madness, by by all means. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't even know where to start. I mean, today... Start at the beginning. Th there, were, there was so much that happened today. Uh, for one, some clarity on the on the Tulip Trust, uh, or trusts. Ah, uh, oh, Tulip Trust. We'll tell you what, while we're here, let's have a quick look at that. Why not? Tulip Trust. Let's remind ourselves. Uh, can I move this over? Here we go. This is the uh, Tulip Trust that Kurt was just referring to. So we have a look uh, through this. Uh, there we go. That is uh, 1,100,111 uh, Bitcoin. So uh, in here, for those who haven't seen this before, it says, I acknowledge, I, Dave Kleiman, have received 1,100,111 Bitcoin from Craig Wright. Uh, at the time of the transfer, it's valued at around 100,000 USD. So it's like 10 cents per, uh, per coin. I will form a trust to be managed by at least three people, but no more than seven at any time. All Bitcoin will be returned to Dr. Wright on January the 1st, 2020. And that marks the end of the, um, the commodity period, the neutral growth phase that makes Bitcoin a commodity network. Craig always had the intention to reveal himself because the network would need it for credibility. But what he couldn't do was reveal himself before that time was up and before the keys were returned to him because it would have jeopardized the whole project and it would have also um, uh, discredited the fundamental value that Bitcoin has got with 10 years of neutral growth. That's how it works. As, as Craig made um, very clear today. And a whole bunch of other interesting information. Uh, we are going to do questions, and I will give answers at the second half of the show. But please get them queued up, because the lovely and delightful Alex Moon, my executive producer, the man who has been with me since the beginning of my tenure here at CoinGeek, will be dealing with the uh, will be dealing with the troll box here and taking those questions. And um, this isn't because Brandon was fired. Uh, <laughs> Let's go, Brandon. Brandon, Brandon is good people. He does a very good job filling in. So I want to thank Brandon Ward. What's up, Brandon? <laughs> so uh, really, we're, we're, we're having a blast here. It is a marathon. I'm going to sleep for the entire month of December, quite possibly. But we are uh, we're, we're really rocking and rolling over here. Uh, so yeah, questions ready at the second half of the show. Let's talk about what we saw in court today. Uh, ultimately, it was an entire day of Craig Wright on the stand getting grilled by Vel Friedman. Uh, Vel Friedman is uh, one of the partners over at Roche Friedman and um, a hell of an attorney. I, I have called him a scumbag more than once on these live streams because... Good role are you than me, but nice one. I, I think that that's essentially the character that he plays. Uh, being difficult, uh, the, the, like he, he likes to manipulate and, and play with the rules of the court. Now, this, this isn't a criticism of him. It's a, it's a timbre thing. It's a tone thing. Uh, and and I'm not sure how well that it plays to the to the the jury, but um, I think it it. it I, I would say that it doesn't actually play all that well to the jury at all. Uh, from what Kurt has said before, uh, it sounds to me like you know their side are, are younger, and again, like you said, they're sort of playing up to the uh, lawyer stereotypes. Uh, for an older, more mature uh, juror, um, you know they've seen to be in their sort of fifties. 
Um, I don't really think they would tolerate it. But again, you know, just uh, speculation. Um, but again, you know, they opened up with how, oh, this guy's, the Craig is a liar. He stole from his best friend. It's just like, well, this is a court case about evidence. You know, if they actually had the evidence, surely you would open with that. But instead, you've got to open up with a load of, um, you know, political bravado. Oh, you know, like, um, you know, smearing his character. It's just like, well, look, mate, grow up. It's got nothing to do with character. This isn't a popularity contest. Have you or have you not got partnership? If you've got a partnership, let's see it. If not, shut up. <laughs> That's how I play it. Is clearly a little bit irritating to the judge and um, makes him have to be objected to. Uh, pretty often, so he's uh, he's an interesting character to, to watch, and then in stark contrast, uh, Craig Wright, who is you know maybe maybe the most difficult person to uh, uh, to to examine or cross examine in the history of, of anything. Uh, Craig has his extreme specificity, talking about high level cryptography, and that will be uh, that will be CSW's Aspergis. So uh, what people have to do well. They have to appreciate how highly functioning uh, CSW is. So I know this is this is really hard, but it, imagine like a Formula One grid. Uh, you've got the greatest drivers in the world you know, on that grid, and yet the discrepancy between the greatest drivers in the world is absolutely huge. You know, you've literally got the best in the world that is like miles in front of anybody when you look at the scoreboard, then you have second place and third place, and there's a huge gap between them. So you might be the third best driver in the world, but you know there's a huge gap between you and the rest of the field, but there's also a huge gap between you and the guy at the front. You know, th this is what it's like with uh, with CSW and his um, you know, Asperger's being highly functioning. Like his brain is literally like on a on another level, the best thing I can describe is is almost like sportsmen when they seem to have almost like a, a superhuman ability to uh, be able to do things. Like they have this a uh, judgment, almost like a photographic memory. They they can do things at such high speeds. It's just the way their brain functions. If ever you've seen um, uh, like apes doing uh, like a, a, the the board game matching pairs, literally they can flash a board up. Uh, literally like a millisecond and then ask uh, the, the you give a signal to the ape to you know whatever it was touch what he saw and literally they've got like photographic memories and they need that when they're you know um, swinging through the cheese and stuff you know to, to grab onto the next vine or branch or whatever it is they're using you know, they, their brains need to be like that and some humans have that ability and I would say that's what that's what Craig has got so it's like he finds it hard to relate to people that don't have that. Um, the only reason I can appreciate this is because I've seen and studied other people that have that ability and it blows my mind because I can't do it. I know they can do it. I know I can't do it. Um, there's just no way, but at least you can have an appreciation um, for it. So that that's what sort of uh, Kurt is uh, touching on here. Math and, and the history of Bitcoin and all these different things uh, in, in amid it all, um, it, was, it, was, it was really interesting. Uh, it looked like Vel brought his uh, wife and, and, and daughters, who all were lovely, and uh, they I would say that's a really pathetic play on behalf of their uh, their tactics to try and impress the jury. Honestly, it's just it's all facade, yeah. But when you're bringing your family in, I would say that's a low blow. That's a low blow. Like you do not bring your family or mix your family with business. Uh, so I think that actually is an indication of just how scummy the lawyers are, really, to do something like that there to watch him do this historic uh bit and and they looked like a, a a really nice happy family nice group of people it's all facade it's all facade nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors people there too so i'm uh you know i'm I, i'm impressed just as much as i am uh at sometimes disgusted by the situation but uh to start the day um, yeah, exactly exactly disgusted by the situation is a low blow a political move getting your family involved you know uh, you're meant to, you know, it's pretty outrageous, really. You're meant to be the protector of your family, and yet you're bringing them into harm's way. You're putting them in front of the media. You're bringing them into the courtroom. Yeah, really low. Um, Vel went right into the, you know, talking about these testnet coins again. And testnet was the big news yesterday. Like, oh, Craig, Craig tried to pay David testnet coins or all this stuff. It's not really what was said. Uh, and Vel started out by saying exactly that. Like, so these no value coins, and Craig had to stop and say, well, they don't have no value. And, you know, so they, they, they kind of keep rocking back and forth. He's like, well, well, do they have a price? And he's like, well, monetary value isn't the only value. There's an 
Yeah, that's an interesting point. You know, you have uh, you know, intrinsic value, you have fundamental value, you've got superficial value. You know, like um, uh, uh, intrinsic value is, is personal value. Like if you're really thirsty, you know, a bottle of water will have more value to you than somebody else who isn't thirsty. Or somebody who's just got simply, you know, water on tap or something like that. And then you and then you have price, which effectively is like you know, dollar value. Dollar is purely speculative you know, as well. So, you know, something can be fundamental. Uh, let's say if you're building a building, um, you know, there might be a structure in the middle of the building that is uh, covered that nobody sees and people don't appreciate. You know, but but they enjoy the aesthetics of the building and, and the structure of it. But you know, the the main pillars of the building are often disguised. You don't see them. But yet, without those pillars, you know, the the, the building structure just simply wouldn't stand. So, so that's what Craig is saying. There's, you know, some of the things have like fundamental value. People might not appreciate them, um, you know, but they're they're at its core. Is is what he's saying? An extreme amount of value to having the data, as is the way he says it, about um, about how the network works or could work, uh, and that you know the, the the nature of these blocks. I think he said he mined a 340 gigabyte block, but modeled the way that it could propagate across the network and all these different things. So they were testing. And um, Vel just keeps saying, but they're these no value Bitcoins. And they, so they kind of had a back and forth about like the fundamental value of knowledge about Bitcoin versus the price of Bitcoin. And, and well, these testnet coins don't have a price. And therefore, how could they be valuable? And Craig, uh, well, if the network doesn't work without them, then they're extremely valuable. But just because they don't have a price doesn't mean they <laughs> if they don't have a price, it just means they don't have a commercial price. They're not sold, but, you know, it's because they may be part of something else. The network wouldn't function without them. Gave a pretty rousing speech, actually, directly to the jury. So I, I think this is brilliant of Craig. And Craig Craig likes to turn. He turns like, you know, 20 degrees or whatever to talk to the jury directly. And he says, there's nothing more important to me than the data about my invention. This invention basically broke me up with my wife lynn at the time it's 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 gotten me you know removed from my country it caused all the stuff with the ato like all of the, there's nothing more important than the fundamental underlying value of the idea of bitcoin and knowledge about what bitcoin is capable of to me and and so i he he gave that speech uh, that I just think was was fantastic, frankly, and really, really expressed the the beauty of Bitcoin and the, and and what you can learn by doing supercomputer modeling about Bitcoin. And so, I think that's absolutely awesome. Yeah, I think I think personally that is Craig uh, purposely making an effort to improve his or to improve himself, to develop himself, to understand what uh, needs to be said, like to a jury. I mean, we've all seen him when he when when he first started out. Uh, yeah, I mean, a absolute nightmare. <laughs> uh, but I mean, this is one of the reasons why I spotted him. Uh, I was just like, look, he's he's either the worst con man I have ever come across in my life, or he's telling the truth and he's winging it, and nobody has ever given him any guidance on uh, on public speaking or how to uh, how to talk to people. So the my conclusion to that was that, you know he would be the worst con man ever he wouldn't be making any money from what he's doing and what he's saying and the fact that like nobody's liking it so i was just like well he's he's on the balance of probabilities he's more likely actually telling the truth and uh you know making an absolute hash of it um yeah pardon the pun i hope that that came across as as truly um honest of craig because i think a lot of the rest of the day or a good chunk of the day anyways, is, is a lot of like, you know, you're listening to a billionaire talk about his shell companies and the holding companies that owns the shell company. And then the, and then the trust that owns the holding company that owns the, and like, you know, this kind of thing, like I, while I don't, I, I don't doubt that it's true. I think to an average Miami, you know, juror person, the, the kind of person that is on the jury um, may even have a little bit of a political distance from this and say you know what I, I, I don't know about this this billionaire guy that was smart enough to do all these other things and like you know so I, I don't know how a lot of that plays although I think he handled himself really really well um, that is really really good to hear mostly in the explanation of, of these documents so 
there's a an ATO interview that, that keeps circulating. It keeps coming back. And every time it comes back, um, you know, Vel, Vel acts like it's the first time he's seen it. So it's, Craig, is it not true that you said to Agent, I believe it was Agent Miller from the ATO, in this interview, Craig has to say, no, we don't we don't agree that that document is is real. And you will see in the defense portion of the case that we had a forensic auditor come look at this thing and we rejected its authenticity. And ultimately, the agent that was interviewing me was let go from the division for for corruption and all this different stuff. Talking about Australia being corrupt, we all know what's going on over there at the moment. And then the evidence comes back again. So every single time it comes back, Craig has to reiterate again no, I did not say that. No, this is not an official document. No, this is not how that happened. Uh, and then it's like, okay, well, let's let's cut to, uh, did you forge this email, Craig? And, and then it had to be, well, our forensic person who will be testifying next week is going to explain how this and this happened. Um, and then it's, you know, we cut to, okay, well, here's your, your Seychelles, uh, you know, shell company broker. Did you buy Tulip Trading Limited? from this Seychelles broker in 2014 and then backdate it to 2012. And then you're claiming that in 2012, it's this and that. And and then Craig has to say, well, you're already saying in this document here that, that the Tulip Trading Limited existed in 2012 or 2013. So now you're playing both sides of the fence, Val Friedman. And, and that's actually really quite funny. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that Craig has got not only a, uh, a photographic memory, but also just an absolutely astonishing memory to the point where uh, Vel Friedman, if that's his name, uh, he I don't think he would be able to comprehend just what uh, Craig is capable of. Craig will literally remember everything that he sees and hears. And Vel Friedman just simply will not believe this. So this is why Craig will be able to go back through documents and say, well, if you look here and if you look there and blah, 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 he'll catch him out. You know, Craig, Craig is not one to uh, try and challenge in terms of memory of what did and didn't happen because he will be absolutely spot on in everything he says. And so they're just um, they're having an incredible sparring match. It really is a is a, is a sight to see uh, as Val Friedman again, like gets visibly frustrated. He's, he's animated. He's got his hands up. He looks at the jury. He's, you know, turning around and good looking at his team and turning around and looking at the Rivero team and then turning around to the judge, your honor, you know, the, can the witness answer the question? And, and, you know, and Craig, um, I think picks, picks a few good spots to, to come in and wax philosophical about the power of Bitcoin. Nice one, Craig. And some of what he was doing. And I think the other thing that, that stood out, if there's a thing that stood out today, um, it's how many people in Australia seem to just casually know that, that Craig is Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, Isaac Morehouse asked me a question yesterday asking why the pseudonym, why the Satoshi Nakamoto pseudonym if he was going to file Bitcoin on his 2009 taxes anyways? That's a very good question. So this this is what so many people miss and so many really need to understand, which is why I keep banging on about it. The pseudonym was absolutely essential for Bitcoin to be a commodity network. So uh, a security, as I've said before, is like a ticket with a backstory. If somebody sells you this ticket at an overinflated price because of the backstory, it has to be registered with a financial regulator so that they can they can uh, check out the backstory to make sure it's genuine and you do actually have a claim on something. Bitcoin is not a security. Bitcoin literally gets its value from the utility of the network. And the network is a, um, uh, well, a money. Money has to be a commodity, so it can't have a central point of authority or control. So the network cannot have a central point of authority control or influence while it is in its infancy, while it's growing. This is the stage where effectively gold is being like put into the ground. The network is just simply growing organically. There is no other network on the entire shitcoin market that has an organically grown network. That is what gives it its fundamental value as a commodity. That's what makes it a commodity network. If it wasn't a commodity network and it grew with influence uh, or control or authority of someone, it would not be an organic network and it would it would, yeah, it would be a security network. It would certainly lose credibility. So, for example, Charlie Lee said right from the get-go that he uh, started Litecoin. Now, that it doesn't necessarily make it not a commodity, but it discredits it as a commodity because him saying, oh, I, I, I created this. 
you know, people might buy it because he created it. You know, he has an influence on it. Whereas the pseudonym, it being Japanese, no one knew who he was. The paper written in English, was he Japanese? Was he English? Have you got an issue with either one? What's your, you know, what's your problem? You know, th- this is why uh, Craig actually chose a Japanese name because one, Japan is on the opposite side to the Western world, which is where the white paper was released because it was written in the English language. Um, it's uh, Japan is effectively you know, politically neutral, technologically advanced and, and highly developed. So uh, people w- weren't going to question the credibility of its author. Uh, Japan has also got a, uh, a, a language barrier and it's it, that will enable him to stay hidden while the network is growing. Um, and it's also got a large enough uh, population. So it'll be hard for him to find. You know, th- this is absolutely important. But there, there is a point at that. And the point at which the commodity, you know, the Craig had planned for the um, size of the network to well, sort of come out and give it credibility it was on the 1st of January 2020 when the Tulip Trust was returned to him. That, that, he, that, was his, that was always his plan. But it was absolutely essential that it grew for the first 10 years without their central point of authority, control or influence, which is why he released the white paper on the 31st of August 20, um, uh, 2008 um, and didn't start the network until the 3rd of January 2009. So that period there where literally he let everything go, the entire project could have failed if somebody else had started the network because it wouldn't have been a commodity network. That was the biggest risk he took. All the... Um, all the research and development, everything that he'd done literally could have just been thrown away if somebody had started that network before he did, because it was really important that it was started under a pseudonym. So that this is why he re-released White Paper on the on 31st of October, because that's Halloween. It was an added distraction. And the two busiest months of the, months of the year are the festive period, November and December. So November and December gave him the best chance of starting the network, but still providing that two months time, that two month period of time, which is considered a reasonable amount of time um, in law. So then luckily, so he released the white paper. He started it himself two months and four days later under a pseudonym, stepped away from the project, just let it grow organically. That is where Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network becomes a commodity and Bitcoin finances that commodity network. That, that is, that is the, that's, that is what made, that is what gives Bitcoin its value over all these other shit coins. So yeah, I hope I've explained that well enough. And I asked Craig that was actually what I asked him first thing in the morning when I saw him, and, and he said, "Well, <clears throat> Satoshi Nakamoto is a pseudonym because I wanted to have my privacy." And he's like, "In Australia, your tax return." Well, he wanted to have his privacy, but uh, it was also essential that he had his privacy is also private i didn't intend to remain anonymous uh, yeah he didn't intend to remain anonymous uh well not anonymous it's pseudonymous so obviously the tax authority knew who he was um um uh, professor um is it, yeah, professor uh, david reese uh, uh knew who he was uh, obviously dave Kleiman knew who he was as well uh stephen matthews knew who he was i think he showed him a copy of the white paper somebody had seen a copy of the white paper anyway uh, but, you know, a few people knew who he was, but but the majority didn't. The, the white paper was just simply released to a cryptographic mailing list. People were like, oh, you know, plug in, get money. You know, it starts. You know, how are they going to look for... Where, where, where are they going to start? You know, um, who was Satoshi Nakamoto? Oh, we'll start looking in Japan. It would take ages to find him. Uh, the, the way that he often you hear him say. And so um, the the really interesting thing is that he said... Tons of people know, like all of the people that manage my companies knew. I had I had people that were running mining operations for my companies. I had my accountants were aware. We had uh, various trustees in various other other businesses and all this different thing or all these different things. And then um, it reminds me of a, a conversation that I had with Ian Grigg when I was in um, in Zurich earlier this year. And I was talking to Ian Grigg in a hallway and, and I said, Ian, how did you figure out that Craig was Satoshi? And Ian Grigg gave me maybe the funniest answer I've ever heard in my life. He, he leaned, leaned in and he said, Kurt, everyone in Australia knows that Craig Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto. And I cracked up because I wasn't sure if he was kidding. And so um, Craig, Craig illuminated, uh, frankly, dozens of people. Some of these companies had 50 people, uh, of which many were working on Bitcoin-related businesses and things in 2008 to 2010 and this is all evidence that we saw in court um so that was a really fascinating a really fascinating thing uh where where i think 
that Craig is is going to struggle and and has struggled. And, and this isn't Craig's struggle. It's not the way that he handles it. It's more that um, the way that I think that it's perceived by the jury when there are emails from Craig to Ira or from Craig to Patrick Page is, is another good one where they're talking very pointedly and very deliberately about Dave's participation in Bitcoin. And I'm going to get to what I think was the, the, the pinnacle of the day uh, when, when Craig explained, um, it, when, when Craig cried. Craig, Craig was brought to tears uh, and not in a small way. Craig was crying on, on the witness stand. And we'll get to that in a couple of minutes here. But uh, yeah, just to elaborate on that quickly, um, I do know other people with Asperger's and their, um, their emotional spectrum uh, compared to, uh, I suppose you want to say, uh, the average person uh, for, for particular things um, is, is, is quite short. So there will be certain like emotional triggers uh, to, to an Asperger's person that, that really hits home that they would genuinely have trouble with. So anybody else might see this and think, oh, yeah, it's fake. It's, a, you know, it's an act. It's, it's too over emotional. It's not. It's, it's, this is a, a classic um, a characteristic of somebody who is Asperger's. But Craig was talking about um, just just how much uh, how much work went into these things and how many people had to be involved and and the way that um, his his privacy needed to be maintained, but that it wasn't a secret, and that that when Dave's brother reached out, he didn't realize Dave had a living brother um, at the time, and actually this this is another thing why. Um, why Craig would not have been in in partnership with Dave uh, because of the commoditization of the network. You know, it was absolutely essential that he started the network himself under a pseudonym, and the network just simply grew without their central point of authority, control, or influence. So Craig would not have wanted anybody to be involved with him at the start. You know, you Satoshi Nakamoto started the network. He mined these coins. He would have said to Dave, you know, mine mine your own coins. It, it's easy. I mean, what you could have mined Bitcoin on your phone. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the early days because there was hardly anybody using the network. A block was produced every 10 minutes. They produced um, uh, you know, 50, 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. You know, it, would have been, it would have been easy. There was, there was no need to have a partnership in the mining of Bitcoin. No, none. There was just, there's just no point of it. Uh, in fact, this is probably one of the arguments I would have liked to have put to... Uh, uh, the, um, Craig's solicitors. I mean, I wonder if they actually know um, uh, the the economical side of it being a commodity in the fact that, you know, it had to grow um, without that central point of authority control. Or influence. So therefore, there wouldn't have been a partnership. It's literally you're just you're just mining. You wouldn't necessarily mine something together. Not not early on anyway. Um, and Craig would have been trying to keep himself uh, trying to keep himself hidden as much as possible. There's no way he would have set up a business-related uh, partnership um, to do with the mining of Bitcoin at the beginning, because it would have uh, it would have discredited the, um, uh, the the commoditization of the network, you know, it, which gives it its fundamental value, which gives Bitcoin its value. And when Ira asked, like, uh, you know, hey, is this and that, and, you know, and it, it started with Craig telling Ira, like, hey, don't delete his hard drives; he may have some Bitcoin. And then their conversation progressed. And what Craig said on the stand, and again, I don't know how this plays, and I don't know if this is absolutely factually true, but it is Craig's testimony, uh, saying that ultimately he didn't want Dave to be forgotten. And he said, Dave was my best friend. And he wouldn't be remembered for anything. Like, he, the things that he did were were great, but they weren't the kind of thing that, that were historic in the way that Bitcoin was, but that he felt genuinely helped with Bitcoin and he, he basically exaggerated. What, what he said is that I exaggerated Dave's role in Bitcoin to his family because I wanted his family to feel that Dave did something very important. So, I mean, that is actually genuinely, like, really nice there. And when, I mean, I, 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 doubt, I doubt CSW ever seeing, you know, the future sort of panning out like this where um, we would be in this situation. Um, I mean, he's predicted many things. The foresight he's got is absolutely amazing, but... Um, you know, when you when you you want to give credibility to people that you think influenced you, you know, if uh, if you've got a favorite movie star uh, or, you know, a singer, an idol of yours um, and they've influenced you in some way in your in your 
development as you've grown up you, they've had an influence on on your outlook on life or your attitude to life or the music that you like the music that you produce you might say well i wasn't able to produce this music um you know if i hadn't had or the inspiration um you know from my fellow musicians in the past i would say you know they they helped me they were they were part of it you know guess what this that's what this means you know it doesn't mean there's a business relationship involved to which Val Friedman said, so you lied. And he said, well, yes, I, I, I suppose I lied, but I wasn't. Yeah, I wouldn't ever admit to something like that. You know, you, law, lawyers, if you give a lawyer a straight answer, yes, no, um, they you know, again, they'll just like pick holes in it. Death by a thousand cuts, effectively. This is where you have to get political and don't answer it with a direct question. Um, you would leave out the yes or the no. You can just explain it and say, well, you know, I was inspired by it. Therefore, um, you know, it helped towards it. But, you know, I mean, whereas when, a, when a lawyer goes, oh, so you lied, you know, you're then admitting that you're a liar. You know, oh, well, what else have you lied about? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it's just it's lawyer speak, really. Under oath. And I thought I was talking to someone who was just interested in what their brother um, what their brother did or, 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 or could have done or what he helped me with. And he's like, and Dave did help me. And, and this is, this leads into, uh, how and when that Craig cried and, and he really, he really broke down and saying that, that ultimately, um, he didn't, he didn't talk to his wife. He, he let his relationship with Lynn fall apart because he was obsessed with, his work and he was obsessed with his big ideas he had done all these incredible things in the past the the hard drive hard drive wipe fallacy paper uh, with dave it's just one little little small thing that we've seen him do like we've we've seen just in court we've seen dozens of white papers dozens of published academic reports and academic papers and all these different things and then he talked about how he always wanted to complete this Bitcoin idea, that it's something that he had been knocking around for, he may have even said 20 years or something like that. You know, it's funny, some some people just have uh, uh, moments of intuition where obviously having the intellectual capacity that he's got, he would have seen the problem with money. Me, yeah, you know, just being a lay person, I was just like, well, you know, money, you just get money, you do a job, somebody's got money, they pay you for it. It's, a, it's an accounting system. I, I had no idea... Um, about the value of money until I got into Bitcoin, and then I realised that it's just like if you if you watch Squid Games and you see all these people you know looking up uh, all this paper being dropped into a uh, a you know a plastic dome and they're sort of worshipping it. I look at that now, I just think somebody just printed that. That's absolutely hilarious. And these pilling these people are willing to uh, risk their lives for this bit of paper that uh, you know this all powerful person just simply printed. You know, it's it's really it's uh, yeah. I mean, it just makes me realise how stupid fiat currency is. But when you've been indoctrinated with it uh, from from when you're a kid, you don't really question it. You just accept it for what it is, and it's hard to change your point of view. Whereas I've when I when I learnt about it, I made a conscious effort to just reinforce that thinking until I until I. Um, you, know, you sort of say uh, fake it till you make it. Uh, I now I now realise I literally look at fiat currency and I literally just got utter contempt for it, utter disdain. Literally just making it up on a computer, printing it. Well, who's the person that's printing it? Oh, the person that the person that's also, the person that's also printing it is now the person that's saying that I can't have it. You know, and it's telling his crony mates who are in the banks. By the way, you know, make sure this guy doesn't get any funding. Blah 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 blah. You know, it's just literally a manipulative, coercive. You know, a, a divisive. Destru- it's a, a destructive. A uh, f- method of uh, uh, a medium of exchange is what fiat currency is. It has no purpose other than to enrich a small a uh, um, a minority at the expense of the majority. That's it. They they have. If you just simply printed money and you gave the same amount of money to everybody, all prices would rise and everybody would be in the same position as they were before the money was printed. So there's no point in printing any more money and get, and distributing it equally to everybody. You may as well just not have even bothered distributing it in the first place because prices are just simply going to go up. So the whole point of fiat currency is to enrich the people who own the money printers. That is it. Fiat currency is exclusive. 
because only those who uh, get the money benefit from it because the value of money goes down as it gets printed. So they don't want to give it to everybody else. They want to keep as much as they can as possible. Uh, whereas Bitcoin is inclusive. Bitcoin only has value if more and more people come into the market and start trading with it. That's, I mean, it, the difference is just huge. It's literally black and white chalk and cheese. Um, you know, Bitcoin is so important because of that. Um, and I can't thank Craig enough to have for actually coming up with this idea. This is why I, you know, describe myself as a defender of Bitcoin. I will literally defend it with everything with my last breath. But then ultimately, um, it would have required an incredible amount of work to, to actually get it bootstrapped and all these different things. And that instead of, uh, or that Lynn, at some point, Lynn had asked him not to go on another like, don't go chasing another, like, rabbit hole, basically. Like, just just do the work you're doing. I mean, Craig already owned eight companies or whatever and had all this other stuff going on. But he wanted to do this Bitcoin thing. And he went to Dave. And, and he said... <laughs> Bitcoin sounds like an itch that uh, Craig had to scratch. <laughs> that he went to Dave because he, kind of, he knew Lynn would just say no. Um... But he went to Dave and he conferred with Dave. He confided in Dave. And this is, this is you, like, you start to hear him breaking up as he's talking about it. And he said, and Dave, like, held my hand through encouraging me to go do this thing. And then he's like, and ultimately it led to me breaking up with my wife, divorcing my wife, and, and, and my, my life falling apart. And, and ultimately, uh, Dave helped him through that, too. And he said, Dave, for a time was his only ally because only Dave knew about the Bitcoin stuff and knew what he was going through with Lynn and then knew about the other stuff that was going on in the background. And and he's just, I mean, he's he's, he's weeping. He's choked up and he's weeping as, as he is talking about, um, talking about what he went through in the era and how much Dave's friendship meant to him in that era. And, and, and then he came back and said, so when I was asked about, did Dave have an involvement Bitcoin to Craig, it was it was everything to Craig. It was the it was the thing that made Bitcoin possible. The encouragement, the hand holding, and the love of his friend, even amid the drama of everything else that went with it. And so um, that that really stood out to me. I think that was probably Craig's strongest moment on the stand. Good description there, Kurt, as well. Kudos. Uh, talking about his dear friend and, and explaining that stuff and. Um, the next thing that I think was really interesting was was this conversation back and forth about you know did did Dave did Dave manage the email address the Visto mail Satoshi at, at vistomail dot com and um, it was like well yes after twenty eleven I gave him access to these things well okay well but what about um, you know was Dave the first person to run Bitcoin and, and he said well, I don't know I, I asked him to but I'm not sure I have IP addresses but I, I don't know which one is Dave's and, like I know that Hal and Bear and some of the other people like that first week, like we're also doing it. And um, and again, Craig saying like Dave, Dave probably did have his own bitcoins because he, I believe he was running the software. Like I told. Him. And also the uh, the Tulip Trust. If you work out the amount, so one million one hundred thousand one hundred eleven, uh, that was approximately. Uh, I think I worked out it was about twenty uh, percent of the circulating supply at that time. It's a huge amount, absolutely massive. Uh, there's nobody could have that amount of Bitcoin unless they started mining it from the beginning, understood the significance of it, how important it would be and what they were going to use it for, which is effectively Bitcoin's insurance policy. Them too. And, uh, you know, we from shitcoining like Blockstream and Roger Ver and all the other shitcoiners. We attempted to test things, but um, he claims that after 2011, uh, Dave was given access to the Visto mail account uh, and that he was also given and they had this interesting exchange about uh, whether or not the bitcoin.org login or the bitcoin talk uh, logins were the same or who had what and so Craig had to explain what happened with bitcoin talk and then my boy Thamos uh, actually got a shout out from the stand uh, as Craig was explaining that he had help that yes Gavin was a help and Marty was a help and and he said and I don't like him but even Thamos was a necessary part of bitcoin at the time and and that was it and, and he said but they're not satoshi nakamoto and neither was dave and so again we just saw email after email after email from you know between 
Dave and Craig and Ira and Craig and Dave and, and, and other people and, and uh, this John. Yeah, I think, I think Ira and his, uh, and his crony, crony lawyers, they're, ju- they're just clutching at straws. Literally just clutching at straws. And Chesh- I think there's a nefarious entity behind Ira Kleiman and his lawyers funding them. That's what I personally think. Fellow who seemed like he was the, I think he was the CFO of various companies at various times, and and just dozens of other people. There was talk of uh, Calvin Air was brought up again, Stephen Matthews, Robert McGregor, uh, and all these things. Like who did what, who did what, and when, and, and all the rest of that. So I'm I'm going to take a a moment here. I'm going to ask you to please like, subscribe, uh, hit the alarm bell, the alert bell, to make sure that you get alerted every time I go live to give. Yeah, but let's do it, people. These updates. Uh, about the case and and please share if you're watching live right now i would appreciate very much if you would share live to do um uh, let, let people know that i'm doing live q a that we're talking about the, the case this is a great interview i'm watching the figures now it's only got 2626 views so far it's outrageous when you think all these shit coiners get you know tens of thousands of uh views all the time and yet this is the court case. this is the pinnacle of bitcoin and these shit coiners, you know, well, yeah, again, shit coiners, shit for brains. Of the century. Uh, I'm going to let Alex cut to an ad real quick as I take a glance at my notes. We'll do about 10 more minutes of me doing some exposition, and then we'll start to take questions right around the top of the hour. Alex, please cut to the ad. And we're back, everybody. So uh, let, let's get right back into it. There was a, a bunch of other stuff discussed about this BitMessage client. Um, there was a very blurry screenshot shared of BitMessage explaining um, that they were trying to say, Craig, it's this BitMessage. And Craig had to explain, well, I don't know. This is a really blurry screenshot of something that doesn't really look like BitMessage. And they, did, they talked about how much he and Dave had conversations via IRC. So they asked, are, uh, do, why, why have we received the IRC chat logs, which Craig had to explain. Uh, well, IRC chat logs, I didn't keep any. I didn't keep logs, but Dave could have. And so they're asking, well, why, why are there no communications between you and Dave discussing Bitcoin from this era? And, and Craig says, well, Dave, Dave would have them. So they keep, try, they keep telling Craig, why did you wipe this evidence? How did you wipe this evidence? And Craig keeps saying, like, I didn't. I did not wipe this. I could not have wiped it from Dave's machine. Good point. Stand your ground, Craig. If the if the evidence is missing, it is because Ira specifically uh, wiped uh, wiped these machines. So it was it was um, it was interesting. I, I can kind of see the direction that the defense is going to go uh, in really blaming Ira Kleiman uh, for for basically just mishandling. I'm quite looking for that. They're going to rip him to pieces. Going to make look. At, they're going to make him look like an absolute incompetent clown. Uh, the hardware as soon as he took it. And I really think, and I, I hope, I hope the defense takes a second look at Patrick Page because I think Patrick uh, came across as a really sympathetic witness at the beginning of the trial because we didn't understand where things were going yet. But the more that I hear the name Patrick Page and see the things that he was involved in, he is a cybersecurity and, and, and digital forensics expert who has some of Dave Kleiman's hard drives that were taken from his home and have never been returned. But it was determined... In, in some regard, and, and... I think he's in on it as well. This big cabal, it's a huge conspiracy. Ira has set this on the stand, but went into zero detail. They determined that there was nothing else to look into uh, with Patrick Page. But Ira had sued Patrick Page and then just withdrew it and then sued Craig. And so... Hmm, nothing suspicious about that. I, th- I, I just... The, the detective in me says that there must be something there to look into and and i really hope that the rivero team uh has something interesting at least to bring up in in that regard because it, it just strikes me as as a little bit of information that that really doesn't make um just it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense so i i think he's a something of a smoking gun character that that really needs to be looked into again um, also, I wanted to share that a, a little bit of napkin math. Um, we keep talking about 1.1 million Bitcoins. This is the number that gets brought up all the time. And um, I have often said that it's because we know Satoshi Nakamoto mined something like 
a million bitcoins when when he first got started. But Craig, um, Craig said something really interesting that as Craig Wright, the person Craig Wright, uh, that he mined the first fifteen blocks. So the first fifteen blocks are the property of Craig Wright, but then many many more after the fact were mined by companies that included uh was it the Wright family trust or Wright international investments or, or whatever uh he has a bunch of company names and a lot of them are his name as well so um there was a bunch of stuff like that explaining that well no different companies um did these things and so there was a lot of debate back and forth about craig in your deposition you said uh that, that these coins could have been yours or they could have been um whatever oh i should i should point out because i just saw uh mort in the chat here more, one of your messages from the MetaNet ICU was in in court today as a question about asking if Dave uh, coded the client. That's hilarious. <laughs> and um, and the response from Craig uh, basically saying that like essentially Dave couldn't code. That Dave Dave was you know okay at a couple of things, but was not um, not a capable coder. No like Steve said is. Uh, in this regard and then you know they, they they touched on that again too they're like well here he said that he could edit his way out of hell and he's like well editing your way out of hell doesn't mean you can code bitcoin like that's the, it's a very ambiguous statement there but um some napkin math sorry back to my napkin math uh it seemed like and and this could just be my misunderstanding of which coins are which that we're actually talking about but it seemed like there could be almost two million bitcoins at play here um Although it's only the one point one that are that are talked about in the case, but based on who's talking about what and and how it's phrased, uh, it looks like there could be something like two million. Unless I'm just misunderstanding uh, different holdings at different times, but it seems to stand out that it could be up to two million bitcoins uh, that that maybe should be in contention. I, I don't even actually know. But um, the the really interesting thing is that there was a conversation um, about who owned which Bitcoins at which time and all of this different stuff. And Craig explained that a lot of these coins that are in contention here are not coins that were mined allegedly by Satoshi, uh, that a lot of them are actually coins that were bought from uh, Russian exchanges and some other shady places. He explained basically like, no, I, I bought some stuff that was, you know, the proceeds of, of various gambling debts, profits and all these different things. And so a lot of that was a little bit like, Oh, okay, well that's, that's interesting. That's not something that I realized before. And, um, and I thought that was really, um, it was just new information the way I saw it. That's actually pretty uh, pretty amazing, really. So not only is uh, Craig one of the largest miners of Bitcoin, uh, he also, who also understands the value of them and spare cash that he's got, um, he's actually using to purchase coins off other people as well. He's sitting on a huge stash, a huge stash. Um, then we went into... The Tulip Trusts and the Tulip Trusts, I found. Um, I mean, it's 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 a it's a murky thing. A lot of people don't believe that the Tulip Trust or the Tulip Trusts uh, exist at all. They do absolutely fundamentals to the security of Bitcoin. The Tulip Trust was Bitcoin's insurance policy, hence calling it Tulip. Tulip being a massive bubble, the Tulip Trust was formed to pop that bubble and wipe away all the shit coins. That was its purpose. And I think that, um, well, I mean, it's clear that the, uh, the the plaintiffs want to make that case because we're talking about how. But luckily, it's not going to be used for that anymore, though it is a backup. Uh, that's not the way to do things properly. And I think CSW has realized this, um, which is why initially he was saying that's what he was going to do. But he's changed his mind, thankfully. And now he's doing it the proper, proper way because Bitcoin will be written into the history books. You know, it needs to be written right. And it's going to need Craig to do that. So, yeah, I think this is the best way to go about it. Um, they brought up a company called Abacus that is a Seychelles-based uh, shell company broker. And this broker, um, they, they have emails that Craig says the emails aren't real. That's not actually his email. And that's not the cost of buying a shell company because it was like 3000 bucks or 3500 bucks or something like that to buy um, a, a, an old company, a company with some tenure and some reputation. And uh, Craig... So no, that doesn't make any sense. The Seychelles Corporation, his Seychelles Corporation, which Tulip uh, Tulip Trading Limited is a Seychelles Corporation as well. Um, he was saying that he founded it, I think, in 2011 or 2012 and that it is involved in the creation of the trust and this and that. Uh, but they're saying that Craig bought a an old company called called Tulip Trading in 2014. And, and they went back and forth on 
on all that stuff. But but Craig, uh, I think this is really interesting, is that Craig explained uh, while Vel Friedman had a document up on on the screen and, and Craig kept saying, no, when I say the trust, I'm not necessarily talking about the Tulip Trust. I could be talking about Tulip Trust 1 or Tulip Trust 2. And it's because they they are operated or they're operating different things and they're operated by different companies. Plaintiff solicitors have no idea, like I said, just clutching at straws. Companies. And he explained too, he, he keeps saying, no, no, no. So the, the Tulip Trust is actually algorithmic. It is a DAC. And it is put on... Uh, put on the blockchain is the first DAC. It is a smart contract uh, managed. Uh, it's like a DAO. Most people call them DAOs today, but it's different because it's an actual legal structure. And he said it's a decentralized autonomous corporation. And then if you can unlock using key slices for the uh, for the DAC, that there are more key slices that explain how to unlock the various structures of the trusts and, and all this different stuff. Wow, that's massive. That's massive. And again, this is just Craig, you know, dropping these little nuggets, you know, into the uh, plaintiff's lap. Uh, it just, I think, this just gives more um, credibility to him and actually discredits the plaintiffs and just shows that they're just monkeying around, really. And Vel Friedman just keeps saying, "No, no, no, it's not what we're talking about. It's not what we're talking about. It's not what we're talking about." And um, he's like, "Go up. I explain it higher up in the document that you're referencing here." And he zooms out and it says exactly that. So it's a it's a, a, a document from, I think, 2012. Oh, there we go. So that, that's Craig's memory coming into play there. We're literally, you know, uh, making the uh, plaintiff solicitors look like a fool or incompetent. Explaining the DAC structure and um, basically explaining a whole bunch about the Tulip Trust structure and uh, how he used Dave, I say used lightly, his friend Dave, uh, to transfer assets to Dave amid some of the ATO audit stuff in order to protect some of his company assets. And then they, they had to do a trade back. And they're conflating that. that So the communications about this stuff are about Bitcoin, sorry, when in fact they are about, um, they're, they're about uh, the, these company transfers and things. So uh, ultimately it was a, you know, not, not the biggest day in the universe. There was no like big bombshells, but there was a lot of, uh, a lot of, clarity about the tulip trust has been really interesting listening to craig wright in his own words talking about these things uh and if i had a, a maybe a maybe not a criticism but a fear i i think that my my fear is that it all might just seem too convenient to the jury that every time something looks damning from craig it's well i was hacked or it was a conspiracy against me from the tax office and all these things and so um I have been told that there is uh, proof of this, that there is multiple forensics experts and, and expert witnesses to explain exactly uh, that these things are, are what Craig says they are. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing it. Uh, and I, As am I. I'm sure the jury will hear these things. It, as of right now, I'm still basically scoring at 50-50 uh, from, from what I get out of the jury. Uh, ultimately, I think that the jury... Um, is probably more confused than anything because it's just a convoluted mess uh, in many regards. Can you imagine being a juror in this case? Good grief. <laughs> I think I'd rather rub sandpaper with my, uh, rub my eyes with sandpaper uh, than be in this jury. I mean, literally, if they know nothing about Bitcoin or private keys or anything like this, it must be a nightmare for them. You know, maybe a little bit boring unless they're actually genuinely interested. But I mean, really, this just simply comes down to did they have a partnership or did they not? And at the moment, from what Kurt is saying and what everyone else is saying, there is literally no evidence of a business relationship existing um, in relation to the mining of these Satoshi Bitcoins whatsoever. So I think, again, it's probably just a, like a plaintiff's tactic to discredit Craig. And then they're just basically trying to... They're trying to play a popularity contest and get the jury on their side. That is it. But I mean, again, there is no way that they would bother with all the legal expenses of this, you know, unless they had a fallback. Because literally, they're clutching at straws. It's going to cost them absolutely well, thousands. And I think uh, Andrew Hagen is already uh, um, already after them for over uh, like ninety-two thousand pounds, like one hundred twenty thousand dollars, something like that, that they haven't paid. Um, I mean, they're foolish to take this on pro bono. Um, because of, because of how much it's uh, it's costing them, so I, I personally think there's nefarious uh, forces at play. But again, I'm just speculating. 
and you know who who has experience with with all of this stuff. I thought it was pretty funny. Again, uh, Vel Friedman had to ask Craig, uh, "Are you are are you worth more money than the the nation of Rwanda?" Uh, to which, oh dear. So if anybody hasn't seen that. Uh, it's worth looking at. It shows you the it shows you the progression and the development in Craig himself. You know how he first started. Literally, you couldn't have <laughs> literally you couldn't have made any more faux pas than he did in that in that speech. But you compare that to how he is now. The improvement is almost unrecognizable. Uh, absolutely fantastic. So uh, yeah, kudos there, Craig. Craig, you know, had to respond like, "Well, I was in Rwanda and I was I was angry because you know this and that and." Um, I thought that was pretty funny. And uh, what else? There was another couple of funny ones. Oh, talking about buying shell companies. Uh, he, he basically said, well, th- this whole thing doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't have to wait a day to transfer $3,000. I have a like a $2 million limit. He's like, I'm, a, I'm a, a black credit card carrier. I'm one of the only ones in the world or whatever, which means I think he's got whatever it was, a $2 million credit limit or something on his credit card. And, Blah, blah, blah. Basically explaining the nature of his wealth and why none of this makes any sense. Like, the criticisms don't make sense. And apparently we are going to hear um, forensics experts back up all of the claims of uh, document tampering and things that that have have been uh, kind of a signature of the defense on some of this damning evidence is that there have been... Uh, there was a major, it seems like an internal hack at one of Craig's companies. Uh, some stuff got modified and then leaked. And then it seems like there was a vendetta by the ATO uh, that is um, coming into play here too. So uh, let's do some questions. Alex, uh, let, let's start. Uh... All right, there we go. Nice one, Kurt. We'll tell you what, uh, I'll leave it there, but we'll do uh, Craig Wright Rwanda. Uh, just see if we can find it. Oh, here we go. Let's play this. Commerce. When your people. <laughs> oh, here we. Go. This is what. This is what. Uh, this is what uh, Kurt was just on about. Uh, let's just. Let's just remind ourselves. I mean, th- this is just this. I mean, I even I. I was cringing listening to this. So Craig, kindly join us on stage. So. No thanks for that, but um, anyway, I'm going to do the bit no one likes. I don't like really caring whether you like me. Now, I'm going to tell you the hard bits. Now, in 2009, the GDP of this country was 5.4 billion US dollars. Now it's 8.4 billion US dollars. That's less than doubling in 10 years. That's bad. Now, I don't care whether you say that's good or whatever else. if you want to go into all this other BS, I'm not going to be like everyone over there who wants to sell you a solution. I don't really care because I'm here for the long term. I'm going to be here in 20, 30 years and eventually I don't really care what you say. I'm going to be having the solutions you're using. <laughs> this is so bad. It's so bad. But if you actually if you actually listen to what he's saying, like what he's saying is like it, it doesn't it doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm not here to rip you off. Like all these other people, yo, I'm I'm going to help you, but it has, doesn't come across that way. It comes across like I don't like you, I don't care about you. She's just like sod off. I'm not gonna do what you tell me. I'm gonna do whatever I want. It just it's it sounds horrendous, but you've got to actually focus on what he on the message that he's trying to deliver. That's why I'm saying it was so bad. It was laughable. Now, the fact of the matter on this is, you can open up and allow free trade. You can open up and allow your country to be more, or you can wait and hand money to a whole lot of people. And I'll say this quite frankly, because I've got more money than your country. Oh! <laughs> so I'm not gonna ask for anything. I don't want your investment. I don't want like Stella and everything else to be handed money. I don't really care. I'm just going to develop solutions and they're going to go out there and they're going to be created and they're going to be used because we can basically make them that way. Now... <laughs> I mean, like, it's so bad. It's so bad. It's so bad. Oh, dear, oh, dear. But like, like I said, you actually have to listen to what he's saying. Like, not, not the way he says it. The way he says it is terrible. It's terrible. Yeah, well, and what he says, he expresses it like completely the opposite way to how it's meant to be. 
One thing that annoys me is how, oh, I've got to be happy and tell everyone what they want. No. I'm going to do things so that people can trade whether you like it or not. <laughs> so he's basically saying he's going to help them, but it didn't sound like it. I don't want an African currency. I want the world. I don't really care about an African, pan-African group. I want this group of a billion and a bit people to go out there and trade with Americans, with the Europeans, with Australians, with Japanese. That's what matters. I mean, what he's saying is is, is legit. Yeah, it's, it's good, but it's just expressed in a really bad way. But check this out at the beginning of this. If we go back to the beginning, of the, you can see this snake in the grass. So look who that is. Look who that is. You see that? Where, my, where the uh, cursor is? That is Charles the Scammer Hoskinson, who uh, initially yeah, was what yeah, credited with helping develop Ethereum and then went on to uh, develop you know, Cardano. Absolute scam. And look at that. He, he gets up and he literally walks off when, when Craig comes on. Look at this. And ladies and gentlemen, if you just remove your phones and you type on Google, um, Bitcoin founder. The name that comes out is Satoshi Nakamoto. Right under it, other words. See, look, that's him. He's getting up because Craig knows he's a scammer and he doesn't want to look him in the eye. Australian entrepreneur Craig Wright uh, has claimed he is Satoshi. There we go. Look at that. Look at that. That snake in the grass. Neo X sharp exit stage left. Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of the virtual currency. Anyway, there we go. Right, I've been going for an hour. I hope you've enjoyed that. So for anybody who literally can't get enough of this court case, court case this is a Satoshi's take on things. There'll be more to come. So I'm just as excited as everybody else. And we'll leave it there. Catch you guys later. Get paid for posting your pics on Relica. Download the app now at www.getrelica.com. Get your tweet etched on Twitch, forever on the Bitcoin blockchain. Do it today at www.jointwitch.com. Buy BSV.live, the best place to buy Bitcoin SV online. Support independent content creators on micropayment platforms such as Streamanity, Twitch and Relica. We should profit from our data, not the large corporations who track, monitor and sell it. If you enjoy the Bitcoin content that I produce, please support me by heading over to www.satoshi.tv where you can keep up to date with all the latest news, gossip and content as it's created. Thanks very much. To get started in Bitcoin, go to freebsv.com where you can claim your free Bitcoin. Then head over to Twitter and follow at IamZatoshi, where you can take part in his very generous and world-famous free giveaways. The future of advertising meets the power of Bitcoin at Tonic Pow. Get paid for posting advertising campaigns to your social media profiles. Go to www.tonicpowadds.com.